Security can't solve crucial problems when they have to wade through thousands of alerts a day. With ServiceNow, you can easily prioritize and respond to your most crucial business threats. That way you can go from overwhelmed to under control. ServiceNow brings security, risk, and IT together on one platform. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash ServiceNow. You want to get the right things done for your security program. Sounds simple. But what are the right things for you? What does done mean? And how are you going to get there? Rapid7 realizes more than anyone how hard this can be. While Rapid7's Insight platform offers you industry-leading vulnerability management and detection and response solutions, their focus is on understanding where you are so that they can help you get where you're going. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash Rapid7 to get started. Welcome, everyone. We're here at RSA 2020. I am with my good friend, Mr. Corey Bosden. He is the VP of Product Ma Management. Management. Product Management at Extra Hop. <laughs> See, I told you that the title was too long. Head of Product Works, too. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so, Corey and I work together uh, at Tenable, so it's nice to, uh, to catch up and talk about Extra Hop and a topic that I love talking about IoT, of course. Yeah, this is a good time. I think the last time we got together, I got to heckle you at a container uh, yes, talk at Black yes. Hat, which was very good, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I've built a lot more containers since then. Yeah. So, yeah. We're, uh, yeah, a lot of container stuff I've been doing. Anyway. It, it's a fantastic thing, right? A lot yeah. of people ask. Containers, I used to get a lot of questions about it. Get a lot more about IoT now. Interesting. Yeah. So um, I was talking to you about my enchanting quadrants where I break down basically indicators of compromise into four areas, right? That being network, endpoint, logs, and threat intelligence. When we talk about IoT, it's really the network is the one that helps you. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff with IoT, like endpoint stuff, I mean, it gets weird because you're dealing with different chipsets. Logging is not great on IoT devices if it's there, if it actually works. That's right. right. Threat intelligence doesn't really so much apply to helping you with IoT, maybe a little bit, but the network is really where it's at for IoT. The network is really where it's at. I mean, this you know we see this all the time, obviously. It's a little self-serving for me, but every enterprise has devices where, you know, they wish they were logging, but they weren't. They wish they had an endpoint mm -hmm. agent. But um, IoT is interesting because... Really, the logs, mm -hmm. the agents, they're not an option. And you still need to see what's going on there. And, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff in the news recently with devices that wouldn't be eligible for agents or logging that misbehave. Mm -hmm. And uh, you need some sort of way to see what they're doing and figure out if they are misbehaving. Yeah. And the network is definitely the best place to do that. And the level of visibility you need isn't, I mean, it's not all that much. We were just talking earlier, like, just looking at the connection information in in the headers is usually enough to say why is it making all these connections out to this one host and all of the different ways you analyze that data right that's right i mean um so enterprise iot which is different than consumer right mm -hmm. consumer iot uh, smart bulbs and tvs they don't ever consider security as far as i can tell mm -hmm. um enterprise iot they at least think about a little bit but you know they don't prioritize it. The priority is on ease of use or on mm -hmm. cost or things like that. And so um, we're very fortunate that most of the stuff is still doing fairly insecure things using plain text protocols, et cetera. But even, <laughs> even without that. The oh, insecurity oh. helps the security. The insecurity <laughs> helps the security. I mean, it does help. It's a shortcut to visibility. Right. Um, I would greatly prefer, of course, that the IoT vendors got a little smarter sure. and, and did some things more securely. Um, but even then, to your point, uh, there's still, there's a wealth of information we can get about, mm -hmm. you know, here is a Polycom phone, and it looks like all the rest of your Polycom phones, except this one's now starting to talk uh, to different systems than mm -hmm. the rest of them do. Or it's got interactive login traffic going to it, or things like that, that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, interactive login traffic doesn't take, uh, doesn't take a lot of skill to look at that and go, what is happening with my yeah. Polycom? Why is someone using Telnet to access my camera? That's right. absolutely yeah. right. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of rich information in there. And so we think it's really important. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's an area that attackers have noticed is mm -hmm. there's a foot in the door. You were telling me the story about taking pictures of things uh, remotely. and Yeah, I compromise. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, sometimes there's no authentication on them. Sometimes it's an easily guessable password. That's right. Now you're looking at 
through the lens of the camera in the conference room and I'm zooming in on things trying to read passwords off a whiteboard and on the papers on the table. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it really, I mean, people normally start with like the movie plot things of, hey, somebody's going to, you know, compromise my uh, video conferencing system and listen in on my boardroom meetings, mm -hmm. which it is should. important. Yep. Um, but you may also have smart boards that have, you know, your next quarter's roadmap plans written on them. And mm -hmm. when you hit that button on the smart board to send out those plans to save on a file share, that's just as important IP. And mm -hmm. uh, it's the kind of thing that uh, you need to make sure you're securing. I think the one of the differences in, in hearing talk about IoT between the consumer end and the enterprise end is you have a profile for IoT devices as they're supposed to work in the enterprise, right? Whereas in the home, uh, it's kind of like willy-nilly devices do different things and users have different behaviors and pro you know, like it's harder to profile a device. Uh, it is, but um, you know, this is one of the things where especially if you have, um, like Extra Hub does, uh, mm. if you have a good data science team, um, if you have access to enough data and the right algorithms, you can start to build a behavior profile of mm -hmm. what's normal. Uh, right. One of the things I I like is that um, you know an IP phone tends to look like an IP phone. They all tend to do the same things, and so you can kind of categorize a group of normal mm -hmm. with Cisco versus Polycom versus what have you. Um, they're all going to have their own nuances, and being able to refine and even know, hey, Polycoms do this thing that Cisco doesn't normally do. That's important to know too. But for a lot of your security practices, knowing that something's in a peer group that's um, you know, IP phones and IP phones don't talk to corporate databases. So anytime you see that happening, something worth investigating, that's that's good data to have. And it, you know, it takes takes a little bit of data and a little bit of effort to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, you don't just get an off the shelf of here's what normal looks like, but it is more straightforward uh, with enterprise devices to profile them like that than you say consumer. You just give me an idea because one of the things that we'll do as attackers, right, is upload custom firmware, right? Mm -hmm. If you're looking at all of the network traffic and what's normal, you could probably tell me that like, hey, normally this firmware update comes from Polycom's IP address space. Uh, yesterday it came from China. <laughs> <laughs> why, 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 that's not normal, right? So looking at where the firmware updates come from, and now that I think about it, is a perfect application, I think, for extra. I'm assuming that you... L looking yeah. where the firmware updates, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, if you have threat intelligence and you can say this is known bad domain, known bad IPs, great. Yep, yep. But even again, the more prosaic, just setting up the peer group of, hey, Polycom seem to always update. They get their updates on Sundays. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's one that's updating on Tuesday. Mm. That's unusual. It's outside the normal peer group behavior. And this is the kind of thing we've been doing for years mm -hmm. uh, is setting up a notion of what's normal and mm -hmm. what's not normal and calling it out. And IoT is really ripe for this. And uh, as you said at the beginning, right, um, network tends to be the only way you're going to get that kind of uh, identification of something strange is happening here. Right. Absolutely. I notice a lot of devices support APIs. And that's another interesting area of normalization, right? Because... Uh, it, from what I've seen, the devices use the APIs in very specific ways to function to report back. As an attacker, my usage of the API is drastically different, right? <laughs> That's that right. Would, that would stick out. That's a, exactly the same, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but again, there's a normal usage behavior that mm -hmm. you can see and you can understand. They make a couple of calls, they move a handful of bytes, they see a thing that's happening, whereas other, if there's activity where they're mm -hmm. making repeated calls, could be a security problem. It could just be, you know, could be a maintenance problem that you need to go figure out. Um, but it's nonetheless unusual. Pushing larger data volumes, unusual. And the kind of thing mm -hmm. that, as an analyst, I want to know. doesn't mean it's something I have to tackle right away. Uh, but it might be something that's going to make my, my list of things to investigate. Yeah. One of the challenges today, of course, is getting a good asset list of what's on <laughs> your network. IoT devices also, I mean, you, we work for them, right? Yeah. W IoT devices are particular, uh, particularly problematic because they can fall over in a scan. They are often difficult to fingerprint because there's so many different versions of that device, right? I mean, there's lots of challenges in just finding, and anyone can go take this small little device and plug it into the network, right? You didn't see a, a shipment being made or a, you know, just plug it in and there it is. So how do we today do a better job of discovering our IoT devices on the network? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And you and I do remember, right, at, at Tenable, uh, you know, it's kind of a running joke is when I saw a device that said it was Linux or in 
F5. Mm -hmm. It probably meant it was IoT because that just happened. That's what Nessus can do with an active probe, mm -hmm. figuring out, okay, you know, that's the best I can guess about this. Um, but IoT devices tend to be fairly chatty. Mm -hmm. uh, they send out things on protocols like MDNS or such, and there's a lot of good data in there. Uh, there's information about, here's, uh, you know, I'm a Samsung Galaxy Note 7 running Android, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know how to look at that data and deconstruct it, if you're positioned in the network in a place where you see that sort of data, then it's really easy for you to call out, not just, hey, here's IoT, but here's manufacturer, here's model, mm -hmm. um, here's some other information on these things that is all in that, you know, chatty traffic that's occurring. It's awesome because there's a series of protocols that are all broad, mostly broadcast based traffic yeah. that you wouldn't even need a span port right, to mm -hmm. see it, but uh, there was an open source project that was using that to fingerprint the network. That's right. And so your team has obviously thought of that as well and gone, that's a great way to learn about IoT in your environment. Yeah, I mean, there, uh, and there are a lot of great, um, there's uh, they're great o open source projects. There's a lot of protocols you can look at. As I mentioned, MDNS, mm -hmm. DHCP is great. If you have yep. a centralized DHCP environment, when things ask for IP addresses, they tend to be fairly verbose about what they are. Mm -hmm. You can parse that data out. There's internet printing protocol. There's all sorts of protocols that, um, you know, when you're somebody like ExtraHop and we're good at 60, 70 different protocols that we can parse, sure. um, then you can look in at that data and you can find out a lot. And it helps you not just get that inventory of everything that's there, but then um, we can also use it to help us establish, okay, here's what normal mm -hmm. may look like, or here's what the peer group should look like for these things. Right. And also telling me if that device should be on the network or not. Well, there <laughs> is that too, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, um, you know, when you know you're a polycom shop and then all of a sudden a handful of Cisco mm -hmm. voice over IP phones show up, it makes you wonder. Um, doesn't right. mean there's a problem again, uh, but it means there's something you might want to look at. Yeah. There is always, uh, as you know, there's security, there's responding to actual attacks and events, and mm -hmm. then there are the things that are, you know, I... I don't know if the term hygiene is right, but it feels like the right one, mm -hmm. where it's stuff that's maybe not a problem, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. And it's worth looking at to figure out what happened there and why. Can you automatically take actions? I know there are, there are some remediation kind of steps, but can I take an action if I find a new IoT device to go move it into a different network through integrations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's one of the things we're really proud of at ExtraHop is our ability to integrate. We have a lot of easy ways uh, to programmatically or automatically get the data out and mm -hmm. talk to a Palo Alto to put it into a quarantine group, talk mm -hmm. to Cisco ICE, uh, do other blocking with you know whatever uh, infrastructure you have. Mm -hmm. um, you always have to be cautious, right? I remember my first experience with a, a Cisco NetRanger in the late 90s shunning my corporate DNS <laughs> because I had misconfigured it. So that we brings like back memories, Corey. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, not good ones for me. But mm -hmm. So it's one of those things of um, we think it's really important to equip people with all the information to feel confident about mm -hmm. being able to investigate and understand. But then absolutely a lot of, uh, a lot of customers, when they get that level of comfort, um, the next thing they want to do is automate so yeah. that they can remediate at machine speed. But even if you can get to the point where you get in every morning and maybe there's a ticket or maybe you just go into the console and says, hey, here are the five new IoT devices that I, I saw on the network. And you can go, yeah, move those over here. But this one I want to investigate, so don't move yet or whatever the case may be. Right? That's yeah. absolutely right. And that's, um, you know, the ability to not only find things, but then catalog, catalog them, mm -hmm. make it useful for you to actually see here are the new things. Here's what it's been doing. Let you assign labels, put it in groups. That all wor workflow bit, mm -hmm. that's just as important in enterprise IoT as it is in things like traditional infrastructure. you got to know what you have uh, so that you can secure it. Yeah, and I, I really, and John Strain has the, uh, I believe the famous quote that your interface looks so good I want to lick it. Um, <laughs> and But the more I've seen of the product, your interface is really slick and I think that's really important. We don't always see that uh, in software in general, right? Not even just security, in software in general we don't see really, truly good interfaces. Yeah, I um, I would absolutely agree with that. That was one of the things that initially attracted me to ExtraHop is, mm. I mean, it's a gorgeous interface um, with, with all the requisite pew-pews and dark modes. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also an incredibly functional interface mm. that does really make it easy to see and understand what you're doing. You know, I'll give shout outs to uh, uh, Creighton, Brooke, and Mike, our, our UX team. They are fantastic and have really put design thinking first in our product. I mm -hmm. think it shows. 
Awesome. Uh, I want to make sure we send people to the right places, uh, Corey. Um, try RevealX Cloud for free. Absolutely. Uh, securityweekly.com forward slash extra hop uh, to get more of the interviews that we've done. We catalog them there and uh, to get the extra hop uh, Reveal X Cloud for free. Reveal X Cloud for free. We think it's a, it's a fantastic step into giving visibility into your native cloud environments and I uh, hope people try it out. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Corey. All right. Thank you, Paul. It's been a blast. Welcome to Security Weekly. I'm your host, Matt Alderman. It is day three at RSA Conference 2020. We are in Broadcast Alley in Moscone West. Joining me for this interview is a really good friend, Todd Weller, Chief Strategy Officer at Bandura Cyber. Welcome. Welcome. I'm glad to be back. It's yeah. It's been a while. It's been a while. We, it's funny because every once in a while, you and I get on email going, I got to get back on the show. It's so much fun. And <laughs> you know, when everybody comes to San Francisco, it's a really great opportunity, I think to really sit down with, with different folks and kind of get updates on, on where things are. Um, so what's going on at Bandura Cyber lately? A lot of good stuff. So uh, there's been a, a lot of positive change in the last six months. So we had a leadership change. Uh, new CEO came on board. And uh, what I'd say is we've uh, put in place a stronger foundation in a number of areas, uh, including kind of on the product side, kind of putting more investment there to uh, improve the quality and performance of the product. So we just released a next-gen version or a new version of our uh, core OS that runs on our threat intelligence gateway. So that's uh, well received and we've uh, invested more in the product and engineering and QA front. And mm -hmm. so you're going to see a lot more kind of innovation from us. Uh, I think the other big change has been from a sales perspective. Uh, we've really, really rebuilt kind of the whole sales and go-to-market to better aligned to the markets we serve. So having kind of a sale SDR layer right. uh, inside enterprise reps. Um, and then uh, from a positioning and messaging perspective, you know, we've talked in the past around threat intelligence gateways. It's a category that, uh, you know, Gartner defined a few years ago, and that's right. still very important to us. But we're now positioning more as a threat intelligence protection platform. And I'm happy to kind of go into kind of what all that means and yeah, because I, I did some early work with with parts of your team because I was interviewing for 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 one of the roles over there. Which one? Uh, CEO. <laughs> 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 Ron had the interview there uh, a few years back before you got there. Yep. And so I, I I know the the product line pretty well and and some of the things and the the one challenge I always had with this concept of a threat intelligence gateway is, eh, right? I mean. Gateways are interesting, but but where's the value in that? And in what you just said is threat intelligence protection, right? Now I can see some value, right? And and I think one of the interesting parts about what Bandera Cyber does is it eliminates a lot of potential threats. Yep. Before they even hit the firewall. Right. Right. Which which to me is more than a gateway, right? Yep. Because gateways you think of as ways to direct activities. You don't think about them as ways to remove threats out of the out of the um, environment. So the concept of a threat and tech, a threat intelligence protection to me is a lot more like to the point of what you guys actually do. So walk me through some of that. Sure, and, and you, you hit the nail on the head, right? Protection is important, right? Because we are blocking, we are preventing threats, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the evolution is about how we do it. So if, and, and the story is really the same. It's just, you know, I'll explain it like this. So we, you know, a are aggregating threat intelligence from multiple sources, right? right? That's consistent. Uh, we focus on IP and domain indicators, but we partner on that front. Uh, WebRoot, domain tools, mm -hmm. um, Proofpoint. Uh, the second angle is we integrate threat intelligence. So that's where folks already have it. And so there, again, we're, we're partnering with folks like Anomaly, Recorded Future, Threat Quotient, Threat Connect. And the way we do that is out in the cloud, right? So that aggregation and integration layer is all being done out in AWS we use. And not only are the indicators, but the enforcement policies then are flowing from the cloud down to the threat intelligence gateways mm -hmm. that are on-prem. And so that's kind of the holistic approach. And if you think of kind of vision long-term, and I'll come back to the gateway piece, that you know our gateway is critical today. So it adds a ton of value relative to what you mentioned with the firewalls, and I can talk about examples of that. But there's also a future where maybe we're not doing enforcement on our gateway. Maybe as we go to AWS, we're doing some enforcement through an AWS native mechanism, right? right? So giving us that flexibility to deliver threat intelligence from any source 
and associated enforcement policies to not only our enforcement mechanism, but others. And right. so it's more of a holistic explanation of how we do what we do. And I do think it better communicates the value. And it's been really well received with, with uh, customers. Yeah, I mean, what I really love about the, the product is the firewall has its purpose. And when you throw certain things at it, it, it just doesn't, <laughs> it can't scale to do what it was meant to do from, from that perspective, right? And so by adding this layer on top of the firewalls and getting rid of known threats yep. makes the firewall's job more efficient at what it is supposed to do. Now, I, I believe some firewall vendors have attempted to do aspects of what you guys do in the firewall, but then we see them kind of fall over. So I'd like, I'd like to hear some of those use cases about you know, what does that look like for somebody that's running, you know, large firewalls yep. across their environment? W what kind of performance improvement and impact do they actually see by putting a Bandura Cyber in front of that? Yeah, and I'll give you a couple perspectives. And, um, you know, so, you know, I'm a reformed Wall Street analyst, so I'm always looking for data points and validating and validating things. And you know, I've been here two years now, so I can tell you unequivocally that when you talk to folks and you say, you know, you can't put third-party threat intelligence integrated into a firewall at any scale. The heads nod. And these are <laughs> these are end users across the spectrum, right? Right, And that's because of what you talked about. Firewalls are doing a lot. Add-on encrypted traffic to that. There's more of the load, right? Um, so that is, a, that is a major challenge. And so that still is a core use case for us. So we have 250 customers today. Uh, I'd still say the majority are small, mid-sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. But we're starting to see more interest going up to the enterprise and you know, two use cases or two examples I can give you are, you know, one's a large health insurer that um, has threat intelligence. They use Anomaly as their threat intelligence platform, and they wanted to do enforcement. They had built a homegrown system in their routers using BGP peering. System blew up. Person that developed it was no longer there. They then looked at doing it in their Palo Altos. They couldn't. And, you know, they looked to us as that kind of enforcement mm -hmm. mechanism. Right. So they came at it from how can I enforce at scale? The other important angle there, I would say, and, and this is a great example to me, was uh, what was last week, is it's not just about what capacity a firewall can handle from an indicator volume, mm -hmm. but it's managing blacklists. So uh, last week I got an email from, I called a former customer, it's a bad way to say it, but <laughs> he was, he was um, a security guy at one of our customers. He left that company, went to another company that's not a customer. Of course, I tried to recruit him and <laughs> you know he was too busy, but last week, 10 months after I get an email, it says, sorry, it's been a while, but I was thinking of you today because I was screwing around with my Cisco ASAs. I was working on my blacklist and ACLs, and I started cursing at this <laughs> thing, you know, wishing I had, you know, Bandura Cyber Solution. Can right. you send me some information on it? So, yeah. so to him, you know, that shows kind of the manual workload of right. managing and maintaining blacklists. So, so those are the two major use cases. I, I'd still say, though, too, when... It comes to the small and mid-size org. For them, there's also the threat intelligence play that right. what we're giving them is broader than what they're getting from Palo Alto or Cisco, and they're valuing that other layer, all the threat intelligence. Yeah, and you talked a little bit as we were prepping for this about open threat intelligence. So you're using a lot of different sources to pull together your threat intelligence right. to offer and then customers can tap into that threat intelligence as part of doing some of this protection uh, at the gateway level, right? And so ta this concept of open threat intelligence is you want to be kind of the aggregator and make it easy to use and, and, and really help the protection mechanism, right? Yeah, and, so, so it's, and it's interesting. So I'm, you know, I uh, Googled open threat intelligence, right? And what you're going to get is open source threat <laughs> intelligence. Right. And it's not exactly the same, but there's a lot of kind of commonalities, right? So what does open mean? It's not closed. And so if you look at a lot of the security controls today, they're powered by their proprietary threat intelligence, mm -hmm. right? And that kind of sustains itself. It's their, it's their value add. So you mentioned vendors have made moves to work with third party. You know, they have, right? I mean, let's look at the firewalls. Palo Alto has mind meld, mm -hmm. right? Um, that hasn't really worked so well. Vendors have tried to share indicators, Cyber Threat Alliance. So right. there's, there's not an incentive to be open, even if you can get past the performance right. issues. Uh, the other aspect is kind of flexible because threat intelligence changes and, uh, and portable. And so this theme of open is that there's lots of threat intelligence out there. Customers should be able to use the threat intelligence they want and then 
integrated into security controls to, to protect their business. And that's a big challenge today. So, um, so this concept's gaining momentum. And I did a panel yesterday here uh, with DHS, Global Resilience Federation, and um, John Hopkins uh, Integrated Adaptive Cyber Defense. Yeah. And you can see it from the, the people outside asking questions, this challenge of, I want to use more threat intel, but it's really hard for me to integrate it into an environment that's still largely closed. I mean, although yeah. there's, there's a little I bit mean, of there's, openings. There's some yep. opening. I mean, we've seen some threat intel aggregators yep. uh, pulling data together. I, I think what you're building is kind of like the Uber integrator, right? Because you're integrating so many different sources. Some of those happen to be uh, consolidated sources already, but you're still augmenting that with some of the other sources. That's, I think that's really challenging for a lot of organizations. Yep. Uh, which goes actually a little beyond just gateway protection, if we think about it, right? Because that data is also relevant at, in the SOC. H have you thought about how some of that then gets leveraged not just at the gateway, but potentially behind the gateway in the in the SOC? Yeah, and I'll give you a couple angles, because we do see, you know, we're talking more about like a downstream data and analytics play, mm -hmm. because what the gateway and the enforcement is, is doing, right, is sensing. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of things, right. right? So there's the obvious, which is gets back to more of a proprietary threat detection, like we're seeing things, right? And so we can help improve that. Um, but there's a couple interesting angles, so one, Folks that have invested a lot in threat intelligence are having a tough time with ROI, mm -hmm. right? Like, and there's a couple angles to that. One is, is there ROI in threat intelligence? And I, I think the answer generally is, is yes, because threat feeds will give you additional visibility. As long as you can make it actionable. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Right? That's, so yeah. It's, it's the threat intelligence by itself without the ability to effectively take an action is where I think the difficulty comes. And in the early days of threat intelligence, it was all about the data, not about the actionability. What you guys have done at the gateways, you've made it actionable. Right. Right? But I still think in the SOC, yep. that's still a little bit of a challenge. That's why I asked, is there a way to bring some of that back down in there? Because if I can turn that threat intelligence into actionable information for the analysts, the yep. SOC analysts to make decisions, um, there's a win there. Yep, and so here's how, we, here's how we approach that. And I'll, I'll give you kind of a higher level answer of where the market is, and, and I think it's heading this way. But So I think part of it is a threat intel maturity. Mm -hmm you know, progression, right? People got feeds and said, oh, how do I manage these? Then they go out and buy Threat Intel platforms, right? To aggregate, make mm -hmm. sense of them. And, and it, that takes time. And then th you have to get confident in your Threat Intel before you take action. So I, uh, this was a year ago, um, large energy company. Uh, I was at the GRF annual summit and they attended my presentation. And a guy came up to me and said, man, I really like what you do. And he, he said, but you're about a year too. You're a year ahead of us. Oh, in, in a it. year, yeah. and this is this is a big progressive right. user, right? Mm -hmm. So they have not yet gotten to the point of taking action at scale, but but they're um, they're they're getting there. Um, Vulnerability's gone through the same thing. Yep. Right. I mean, I mean, we're following a very similar path in the days of vulnerability assessment, to vulnerability management, now vulnerability prioritization, the ability to really start take action. I mean, we've been doing that for almost twenty years now, and we're we're still maturing that process. Threat intelligence came way after that. Yeah. So and so threat intelligence is kind of going down that similar path, right? I need to collect the data, okay. But then I need to be able to make sense of the data, correlate it with other things, and turn it into actionable intelligence versus yep. just a big data feed. Yep. And I think the, the angle we help to do that in, in kind of in this evolution is like we have a big focus on integrations right mm -hmm. now uh, with SIMS, with SOARS, right? right? Because at that level, that allows you to kind of get more context in what you're doing, right? So one is our sensing can provide, you know, visibility into those systems. And that's like a basic, right? Yeah. The gateway has to send logs to the SIM, no duh, right? right? right. But what more I'm talking about is through the SIM, being able to do an automated action. What I honestly got to get smarter at is, you know, SIMs are buying sores and, you know, how is that all being done? But right. we're, you know, we're working to update our Splunk app now. And soon after that, we'll be looking for how can we enable through Splunk Enterprise or Fant Splunk Phantom, whatever kind of right. you know, combination way that, combination that, is, that yeah. looks, but the ability to take an automated action. And so I think you have to have both. To update a protection rule. Right. Right? Yep. If, I, if I see something uh, maybe inside my network, it, but we didn't see it on the outside, is there a way to, you know, e e yep. making those correlations and then allowing some updates to the protection rules in a more automated fashion, hopefully puts better protections in place. Yeah. At least at the gateway. And I think for us as a company, 
those partnerships are going to be huge, right? Because it gives us exposure to the people that are taking mm-hmm. action right. with it. And so, yeah. so uh, you know, I'm very bullish. I think there's, you know, threat intelligence has a long way to go still. But it's, you know, small, mid-sized businesses are adopting it more. The large enterprises are starting to operationalize it more, like we right. talked about with taking action. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity. Yeah, and then as that continues to mature, now the gateway is sitting there to actually do a lot of protection makes a lot of sense because it just it just gets a lot of the noise out of the way. Let's at least your perimeter firewalls perform better, and then any of that threat intelligence that helps the the SOC from an internal perspective only adds more value as those organizations continue to mature. Yeah, and one of the things you said, which I didn't really answer you because one, I, I'm not sure I have a great quantitative data point, but I'm going to speak to the point. So, um, on the one hand, we're providing another layer of protection, Mm -hmm. right? There's 3,000 companies, um, not that many here, but there's (laughs) lots of folks that are saying, buy my silver bullet, you know, we'll, and and we think we're different how we do that with the openness, right? And use the threat until you want, but the efficiency angle is an important kind of combination there, right? So the fact that not only can we give you another layer of protection, but when you deploy this in front of the firewall, right, you reduce the load on the firewall. Right. Your firewall can do more, you can get more out of it. If you have threat intelligence investments, you can increase your ROI on, you know, on taking action with threat feeds, but there's also companies that are using a lot that aren't sure what the ROI is. So now you can see which threat feed mm-hmm. it, you know, is adding value in right. your protection. So I think there's a, that kind of improving, improving my security is great. Performance and security. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Getting both angles. I'm getting security, but I'm also getting some performance improvement. And for organizations that rely heavily on their perimeter firewalls, that's actually kind of important. Yep. And and then the manual workload. Like that example, that dude that's sitting there pounding his head as he's dealing with ACLs in a Cisco ASA, right? When it could be really automated. Right. uh, So it's good to have, I think, both those angles. Yeah. It's awesome, Todd. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Thank you, everyone, for watching and listening. We'll see you next time.